Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. Previously, in EC 2026 Introduction to Signal Processing, we looked at Z transforms in the context of finite impulse response filters. In this lecture, we'll look at them in the context of infinite impulse response filters. We'll describe IIR filters in terms of their system function, in particular, the poles that were not terribly important for FIR filters because they're all at the origin for finite impulse response filters play an essential role in the behavior of infinite impulse response filters. Like with FIR filters, we can get the frequency response of an IIR filter by plugging in e to the j omega hat for z. We will explore this further in a future lecture. And the system function will give us a convenient way to relate time domain behavior with frequency domain behavior. Here we have the formula for the Z transform of an impulse response, which gives us the system function. This is also sometimes called a transfer function. But this is a general concept. I can also think about a generic sequence X, which would give me a generic Z transform big X. Now the Z transform shown here is a generic form with this lower limit of n going all the way down to negative infinity. So this is what's referred to as a bilateral or two-sided Z transform. These can get a little complicated. When you talk about bilateral transforms, you need to pay close attention to things called regions of convergence. In EC 2026, we generally restrict this lower limit to be zero. So we'll talk about impulse responses for causal systems, for instance. This is referred to as a one-sided or unilateral Z transform. And for the unilateral transform, regions of convergence are less of a big deal. If you want to learn more about Z transforms and their full two-sided glory, you can check out these lectures for EC 4270 by my colleague David Anderson. In a previous lecture, we computed the impulse response of a simple first-order IIR filter. If we plug that into our Z-transform formula, we see there isn't really a difference between the two-sided and one-sided transforms in this case. Because our impulse response for that particular case starts at n equals zero, the two transforms are equivalent. Here I've also taken the B0 and pulled it out in front. Now we can apply this form for a geometric sequence where we can take the sum from n to infinity of r to the n and rewrite it as 1 over 1 minus r to simplify our z transform summation here. So I can take the a1 to the n, z to the minus n, and rewrite that as a1 times z to the minus 1 all to the power of n. Then I can equate these stuff in parentheses here with r and rewrite our z transform as b0 over 1 minus a1 z to the minus 1. Now recall that the summation only works if the magnitude of r is less than 1. Now r is a1 over z, so we'll say that this summation formula only works if the magnitude of z is greater than the magnitude of a1. This is the region of convergence. Fortunately, in EC 2026, we generally don't have to worry about this in a whole lot of detail. The pairs and properties shown in lines 1 through 5 on this table are things we've seen before. Number 6 is this new property we computed in this lecture, that a to the n u n transforms to 1 over 1 minus a z to the minus 1. So I have three different descriptions of this first order IIR filter. I have the difference equation, I have the impulse response, and I have the system function. The impulse response is infinitely long, but we have this nice compact formula for it that's specified by only a few coefficients. Now, what if I wanted to find the impulse response of this more complicated system where, in addition to this b0 xn term, I have this b1 xn minus n term? The key here is to realize that it's a linear time invariant system, so I could think about what the output would be for this particular input, and then separately think about what the output would be for this particular input, and then add the resulting outputs. 
So from the B naught X event term here, I wind up with this first term of the impulse response, which is what we had before. And from the second term, I'll have a similar kind of form, except I just have B1 instead of B0. And because the input is delayed by 1, my output is delayed by 1. So I have N minus 1 here and here. That's the beauty of the property of time invariance. Now to compute the system function, I can remember that a delay by 1 in the time domain corresponds to a multiplication by z to the minus 1 in the z transform domain. So I can easily write the system function as the sum of two forms via the linearity of z transforms, where the second one has this z to the minus 1 in the numerator coming from that delay. And then I can combine these over a common denominator. Now, if you are a mathematician, you can imagine all kinds of weird IIR filters with all kinds of weird impulse responses. In this class, we'll be focusing on IIR filters that you can implement with difference equations that are going to have system functions that are ratios of polynomials in z to the minus 1. This will restrict us to talking about filters that you can readily implement in practice. Now in this example, to find the system function from the difference equation, we first made this stop by determining the impulse response. This isn't what we usually do. Usually finding the impulse response directly from the difference equation can be pretty tricky. Usually what we do is we actually directly find the system function from the difference equation and then we figure out what the impulse response is from the system function. We can apply the Z transform directly to the difference equation. We'll just write the Z transform of little y is big Y, the Z transform of little x is big X, and in the case of transforming little y of n minus 1, well, that's just going to be big Y of Z times this Z to the minus 1 to handle the delay. And then according to linearity, the constants just hang out in front. Now I want to get all the terms with big X on one side and all the terms with big Y on the other side. So let me take this term here and move it over to the left-hand side. When I do that, I wind up with this minus sign here. And now I can factor out big Y of Z to write this kind of form here. And now let me rearrange that equation so I'll divide both sides by big X, so I can write big Y over big X, and then divide both sides by this 1 minus A1Z to the minus 1 to wind up with this form here. This big Y over big X, that's my system function big H. To get a feel for that, remember that the output of a filter in the time domain is equal to the input convolved with the impulse response. And remember that convolution in the time domain corresponds to multiplication in the z-transform domain. So I can simply take this expression here and divide both sides by big X. Let's apply this idea to this more complicated example where we added this b1 x n minus 1 term. We can apply the same kind of idea of using the delay property where in addition to using it on the y term, we're now using it on this x term, where the x in minus 1 gives us this z to the minus 1 times the big X in z transform land. I once again take this term on the right-hand side with capital Y and move it over to the left-hand side, yielding the minus sign here to get Y on one side. So I can factor capital Y out of all the terms on the left, and capital X out of all the terms on the right. So I could write this as big Y over big X, which is my system function H, equals B naught plus B1 Z to the minus 1 over 1 minus A1 Z to the minus 1. So we can think about the numerator as being a function of Z that we're calling capital B, and the denominator being a function of Z that we're calling capital A. Now, if I want to get the impulse response, I need to invert this Z transform. So here we can use linearity to split this up into two terms, and then we can look up the inverse Z transforms we need on our table. So 
this first term is going to give us B naught A1 to the N times UN. And the second term will give us the same thing, except we'll have B1. And this Z to the minus 1 gives us a delay of 1. And now my complete impulse response is the sum of those two terms. This form gives us an interesting interpretation. We could imagine implementing this system using two first-order IIR filters in parallel, where the second one includes a delay. And I can imagine thinking about the impulse responses of these individual branches and adding those together to get the total impulse response. Now, when you're just getting started with this kind of material, it's a good idea to work through these details. But eventually you'll find you'll start going straight from this sequence with the b's and the x's to this sequence with b's and powers of z to the minus 1, and directly from this sequence with y's and a's to this sequence in the denominator here with a's and powers of z to the minus 1. So to get the system function for this equation, in the numerator we just read off 2 and minus 2, and in the denominator, we read off 1 and minus 0 0.8. Notice that there is this sign flip on all of the coefficients for the y's on the right-hand side that comes from when you implicitly move them over to the left-hand side. And you want to be able to go the other direction. So we might give you the system function on a quiz, ask you to write the difference equation, in which case you should write this. One thing to watch out for is if there's missing terms. For instance, if there's a 2 here, well, you want to put a 2 here. And if there's a 10 here, then you want to put a 10 here. You want to pay attention to what the actual delays are. As an aside, notice that in this class, and for that matter, most classes on DSP, we're always going to be taking inverse transforms by looking up stuff in tables. There is an explicit formula for the inverse Z transform, but it's this weird thing that involves contour integrals in the complex plane, so we're not going to use it. This is in contrast with our discussion of discrete time Fourier transforms, where we often explicitly computed inverse DTFTs. The last thing I'll mention here is that if you've taken a class where they used Laplace transforms to solve differential equations, and our discussion of Z transforms and difference equations, is giving you similar vibes, that's not a coincidence.